This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. In this chat, I am privileged to, to have Larry Lont on the show. He's the guitarist in Primus, and the catalyst for our chat was due to Primus' 2018 Australian tour. Larry talks up. He shares his enthusiasm, his anticipation for the shows. He reminisces about past tours in Australia, and perhaps most notably, he sheds some light on his tenure as the founding guitarist of Possessed, which is a band that's credited by many as the first ever death metal outfit. Larry's insights into his time with Possessed are particularly fascinating, as he was not accustomed to being asked about this aspect of his career at the time. So the chat is truly worth it for that reason alone, as we gain unique perspectives from Larry. Yeah, so let's get to it. Here he is, Larry Lalonde, who used to be in Possessed and the longtime guitarist from Primus. Larry, how are you, mate? I'm good, man. How are you doing? Oh, plugging away, mate. Plugging away. You know how it is. I've been looking forward to our chat because I've got to say, I've, I've genuinely been a fan for. I was trying to count the years, mate, but I got into you guys when I first heard Pork Soda and then worked back and got into the two albums prior to that and, of course, suck on this as well, the live album. But uh, it's quite a thrill. After I don't know how many interviews I've done now, but it's always a thrill to talk to a man and a band who I've been a fan of for a very long time. So there you go. <laughs> uh, well, that's awfully kind of you. It's nice to talk to someone who uh, is a fan of the music. <laughs> Wonderful, mate. Look, I know we've only got a, a short period of time, so I'll kick things off. Primus are touring Australia in April with Dean from Ween, so I think it's a wonderful matchup. You know, I've already mentioned fr- Frizzle Fry, Sailing the Seas of Cheese, so many classic cuts and fan favourites to choose from. So what sort of show are you guys bringing down to Australia? So, for example, will it focus on the new, the classics, or something else entirely different? Uh, you know, we, we try to switch it up as much as possible, but, you know, like you said, there's some songs that people always want to hear, you know, like My Name is Mud or Jerry Was a Race Car Driver. Mm. Um, you know, we've been playing a lot of the new record, which is, you know, it's not a very long record anyway. It's only like 35 minutes. So, you know, you could easily play all of them and still have tons of time left. But, um, you know, it'll kind of just be a little bit of everything. Hopefully. That's a, that's what we shoot to do, at least. Yeah. Mm. Now, I'm going to pay you a big compliment as well. There's two performances by bands that stand out for me. One was by the Psychedelic Furs in 2006 down here at the Coolangatta Hotel. The other one was in 1998. You played Selena's in Sydney. And, mate, your performance that night was blistering. And now, I don't know whether you remember it, but you were quite sick that night. And I believe you had to be roused from your sick bed in order to play. Does that ring any bells? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I totally remember it because I, <laughs> I, I was like, I'm probably our first trip to, to Australia. And it was like, we got there and there was like, you know, it was in Coogee. We're like, wow, this place is amazing. And that's right. we went surfing. And I guess that's what got me was that. Uh, someone said, yeah, you probably got <laughs> something from the water or something, <laughs> you know. I couldn't have been drinking or anything like that. It's got to be the surfing. But, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do remember that. <laughs> Great. Yeah, and I remember <laughs> Les said something very interesting. I think it was after the song, Is It Lucky? said that was damn near the fastest we've ever played that song. And I remember the roar from the crowd was quite something. <laughs> oh, man. That's awesome you're at that show. Yeah, that's God, that was a long time ago. But yeah, I do remember that show. And it just that whole experience was so awesome. Just, you know, because we had no idea. We'd never been to Australia. And that was like our introduction to the whole thing. We were like, yeah. wow, this place is awesome. Wonderful. Yeah, well, we were happy to have you here, mate. But I mentioned Pork Soda as well. So, look, that's an album that really, you know, there's nothing out there quite like it in the mainstream with the exception of some of the albums that Mr. Bungle released. So, what are your thoughts on that album now? And can you believe that it's 25 years old? Wow. You know what? I didn't even know that until you said that. <laughs> it was yeah, that's that incredible, old. yeah. That's pretty, uh, yeah, time flies by, especially, you know, for me, because I'm literally doing the same thing I did 25 years ago. You know, <laughs> nothing has really changed. But, uh, yeah, I, remember, I mean, we made, all of our records have had a totally different way of being made. So that was the one where we were like, you know, we got this record advance and we kind of just went into this warehouse where we, you know, keep all our gear and we just hmm. set up a bunch of like equipment that would, at the time it was like cutting edge gear, but now it's like old digital junk. And it was just <laughs> like a lot of experimenting. And then, you know, we just kept going until we had enough songs. And that's maybe why it's such a, maybe a bizarre sounding record. Cause it 
was a quite a bit of an experiment, you know, which all of our albums are. But that one in particular was very, you know, we started from scratch because we've been touring so much before that record. Mm. And we really had no time to sit down and work on songs. We just went in and started hammering away. There are two albums that are cited time over again by musicians, so guitarists, bass players and drummers in particular. And, of course, that's um, Sailing the Seas and Frizzle Fry. That period, 1989 to 1991, was a wonderful time for music in general. So there was Jane's Addiction, Faith No More, Fishbone, 24-7 Spies, Mr Bungle and King's X all enjoying some degree of success. And that was very overlooked. I don't know whether you'd call it a movement, you know, but before so-called grunge broke big with all of those guitar-based bands. There were some bands that had a wonderful groove that were producing fantastic music, music that I still listen to to this day. But my question for you, mate, is what is it that stands out for you about that era for Primus? Um, well, I mean, like you're right, that time there was so much awesome music. And I think it, you know, for us, it was everything was new. We just got signed. We just, you know, people started paying attention to us because I think before that, like no one really paid attention on the grand scale of like, you know, as far as MTV or radio hmm. to things that weren't like Whitney Houston or, you know, <laughs> Phil Collins, or if it weren't that, you know, if it was like Jane's addiction, it was like, you, know, you didn't really hear about it, but all of a sudden Jane's addiction in a way kind of changed that because Perry came out with Lollapalooza and everybody sort of, you know, started hearing about this thing. Lollapalooza came a big thing. And all of a sudden there's this big concert where it had all these bands that sort of young people wanted to see but no one had ever heard of before. So it was kind of, you know, so the record companies, the radio stations, MTV, all of a sudden everyone started paying attention to this weird kind of new music. Hmm. So it was exciting because, you know, we were really young and we really had no goals other than like, let's make crazy music. But it also, all of a sudden, you know, we're getting some attention for it and people are saying like, hey, we'd like to sign you. We'd like to put you out, you know, Put it out there, put it on the radio. So mm. that was a pretty exciting time right there because of just all those reasons. Look, something a lot of people probably don't realise about your good self is but you're you're one of the pioneers of death metal and, and modern heavy metal really through your time in The Possessed. So I'd like to dedicate some time talking <laughs> to you if that's okay about your time in the band. Is that cool? Totally, yeah. Mm. So, look, I interview yeah. metal musicians. What, what's the, what's... You're right, you go. Oh, sorry, what was that? Oh, look, I, I interview metal musicians all the time, and, and when we get talking about influences, so I mentioned earlier, a lot of musicians cite those first two studio albums from Primus as significant influences. Well, I can tell you, mate, heavy metal and death metal guitarists, when we start talking about who's an influence on them as a musician, your name comes up a lot, okay, because of your work in The Possessed, particularly on um, Seven Churches. So I don't know whether you know <laughs> oh, that, really? mate. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, well, it's it's the case, man. Yeah, I, think... I don't hear I don't hear about it a lot. Well, the funny thing about it is, like, recently people have been telling me, like, they'll say, they, oh, you know, you guys invented death metal, and I was kind of like, I don't think so. But then when I kind of <laughs> think about it, I'm like, yeah, there, I guess there was nothing actually called death metal before that. There was like black metal and speed metal, but there wasn't really anything called death metal before we had the song death metal. So I was like, ah, I guess maybe we did come up with that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, well, look, I think I got the album on the combat, Seven Churches on the combat reissues. I think they came out in about 98 or 99. Okay, so I wasn't a fan from the 80s. I was too young then, but I ended up getting into you guys in uh, 90, 99, I think it was, and I listened to that album back to front many, many times. So you know, what's your take on your legacy? And I've just mentioned, but and, and I need to pay this, you are a revered heavy metal guitarist, even if you haven't been associated with the genre for well over 30 years. So when you look back on, on Seven Churches, what's the most prominent memories? Uh, I mean, the whole thing about that was kind of the, the spirit of everything I've done. It was sort of like trying to just create something new. And that whole kind of music, it was another thing where, no one gave it a chance. Everyone's like, there's no way this music's going anywhere. Like, you know, it's about the devil. It sounds crazy. <laughs> so everyone kind of had this underdog spirit of like, oh, let's see how far we can you know, try to get this out there. And, you know, the Metallica kind of broke and then, you know, Slayer started getting big. And it was like, it was, you know, it was another exciting time where all of a sudden there was this scene that was so underground because of, you know, <laughs> it, was just such, it was so hardcore. And then, yeah it started taking off. So it was exciting. You know, it was another thing where it's like, you kind of felt like you were inventing some kind of new music, which, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it seems crazy, but that's kind of what we were trying to do. At least, I mean, you know, I was 15 also. So I was, you're very I young. High school. 
yeah. <laughs> so that added to some of the craziness, you know. What are your thoughts on Jeff Becerra reforming the band? And I think they've got a new album that's going to be released this year. Yeah, you know, I keep hearing about that. I haven't talked to him in ages. And, you know, every now and then someone will tell me he's doing it, but I haven't seen any of it or heard it or anything. I'd love to check it out, you know. Yeah, I hope I get a chance to chat to Jeff, actually. He seems like a nice bloke, so it'd be good to sort of talk to him in the same way that I'm having a chat to you about a very important album. And, and look, it really is. As I said, mate, it's Seven Churches as an album. It'd have to be in... It'd have to be, I mean, I don't like putting labels on things, but it'd be in the top 10 most influential heavy metal albums of all time, really. I mean, you see a ton of particularly 18-year-old girls, for example, wearing possessed T-shirts. And it's like, how do you get into this stuff? But great. Really? Yeah, it, it made it happen. So I was talking to Blitz from Overkill about the same thing. I see the same thing happen with Overkill T-shirts. And, of course, there's the Motorhead thing as well where supermodels are wearing Motorhead T-shirts. But, yeah, I mean, it's the enduring influence of great music. Wow, that's great to hear. <laughs> I would have never, if you would have told me back then, I would have never thought. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to talk about your musicianship, okay? So my favorite cut that you have contributed guitar to is actually a cover. It's a Pink Floyd song, Have a Cigar. So do you think you'll be pulling that one out in Australia? Uh, probably not. We haven't played that one in ages, but um, funnily, funny enough, uh, just recently, because Every time I get a new phone, somehow it like reloads all my library of music on. Hmm. So that popped up, and I was like, "Whoa, I haven't heard this in ages." So I was like, "Ah." So it did you know? I had I probably just heard it for the first time in years, like three days ago. Um, yeah, <laughs> actually, it, it sounded a lot better than I remembered. So. Oh, it's a great cut. Les's bass playing is outstanding as it always is. But your your soloing at the end of that. How did you go about constructing that solo? Uh, you know, I'm a huge David Gilmore fan of it. I'm sure every mm. guitar player on the planet is. And <laughs> so I just tried to go about it to sort of, you know, that everyone can sing that solo in their head. So I wanted to, I tried to play it close to it, but not exactly the same. Cause you know, what's the point if you play it exactly the same? Yep. Um, that was about it. And the, the funny thing about a lot of those EPs that we did a full cover song, the reason we usually did them was because we, we weren't ready to record an album yet, but we wanted to sort of try out some recording techniques or, you know, try a studio or some new gear. So we would just kind of go in and record all these cover songs. And that's how that one came about. But God, we haven't played that in ages. So I'll, I'll mention to the guys on the plane over on the way to Australia. <laughs> oh, please do. Yeah. I love that EP, by the way, Miscellaneous Debris. It, it's one of my, my favorite releases ever from anybody. So now it's an EP that I, I put on to this day. And the only thing that I think it was missing was you guys did a cover of NIB. I don't know whether you did it at around the same time, you know, the Black Sabbath track, but it was recorded. It sounded like it was recorded right. in the same sessions. But, man, if that EP had contained the NIB uh, cover as well, that would have been quite something else. Pardon me, this is the <laughs> operator. You do have five minutes remaining. Okay, thanks very much. Appreciate that. Made a couple more questions. Feedback from Australian fans and listeners through the years. I mean, Primus are a very popular band down here. I know that because I'm a musician and I'm obviously a big fan, but a lot of the people I know that are musicians are big fans too. So do you get a lot of feedback from Australian fans and listeners? Um, you know, it's hard to say anymore. We definitely used to. Now it's like, I don't know if it's just the way things are. It's hard to tell where anything's coming from, but I know definitely – you know, as you go around the globe, there's definitely a different reception from different places. And Australia was by far one of the places that, re you know, that really took to us. And, you know, that's one of the things we noticed when we started off, because it's, it's kind of a struggle when we started, you know, you'd go to different places and they just kind of stare at you like, what is this? And when we came to Australia, people <laughs> really got it like right off. So, yep. you know. It's yeah, great. no, definitely. It. <laughs> Whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I, I know for myself personally, I got into Faith No More first and there was, there was a, I don't know whether it was just something that, that the media did or whether it was something that played a lot of shows together or what have you, but there was always that association between Primus and Faith No More just from a fan's perspective. So are you still mates with those guys and is there any chance that you could potentially tour with them? Man, I would love to. I'd, I, I don't see them as often as I used to. It's funny because, you know, back in the day, we'd hang out every day just because there's nothing else to do. But um, <laughs> the last time I saw those guys, we played in, I think, Brazil with them. We did a show, and it was so great to see them. I hadn't seen them in so long, like, to actually see them play. Mm. Um, you know, Jim wasn't in the band anymore, but, yeah, they're such a great band. I would That would be 
one of the bands, if I was to make a list of bands to tour with, would definitely be on that list. Awesome, mate. Yeah. All right, mate. It's been a pleasure. It's so uh, it's so rewarding to be able to have a chat to you. You're a good bloke, and thank you so much for answering my questions. And hopefully, mate, I don't know whether it's possible, but I'd love to shake your hand and have a beer with you when you come down to Australia. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, where, where are you at? What city are you at? Queensland, Brisbane. Oh, cool, man. Well, uh, yeah, let's hopefully uh, find each other. <laughs> I'd love to meet you. I'll do the horns from the... Uh, I'll be the guy with the possessed T-shirt on on the crowd, mate. You'll be able to spot me fairly easily, I think. <laughs> Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I enjoyed participating in it. So if you like that one, there are many more just like it over at scarsandguitars.com. And if you like listening, maybe you like reading, because I've written a book about the podcast. Click on the link in the banner on the website. You'll be taken to a marketplace of your choice, and you can download a sample. And if you do complete the purchase, I want to thank you personally. So please do hit me up. I've got some more information to share with you about the book in the moment, but before we get to that, I need to bid you a fond farewell. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Until next time, it is a very good bye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew Mackay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Ball Gear write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, 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 just, I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldina. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, he was very, you know, very open-minded and, and he was into having his, his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for, for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five and Manson gave me that name and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book.